Howdy! That's how a cowboy might say hello. Uh, my name's Pete Donaldson. Hello, this is XVG. Uh, this week you've got a touch of radiation poisoning, a baffling Japanese beat em up, and a South American gun for hire. To kick us off though, let's have a look at what might be hitting the shelves in the next couple of months. Back <laughs> Sam Fisher returns in Splinter Cell Conviction on the 16th of April. He's had a couple of years out and after a bit of quiet reflection, he's back. This time though, he's gone rogue after finding out the death of his daughter was more than just an accident. So, quite understandably, he's still the angriest old man in the world. Save for the man who does mental shadow boxing near Camden Lock every weekend. He could probably smash your head through a toilet as well. And if I'm completely honest, I'm a huge fan of the series. I can't wait for this one. And uh, new features such as Mark and Execute, which may sound like some sort of new drum and bass duo, uh, it sets Conviction well apart from the previous Splinter Cells. It means you can go into any given situation with a bit more of a game plan, which is always good. And uh, there's nothing better than seeing a baddie run towards where he last saw you, indicated here as a translucent figure, and uh, then you running up behind him and roughing him up. The cooperative mode also returns, which which means you can team up with a friend over the internet. And uh, the demo's out now on Xbox Live, so get practicing pulling men off. P pulling men off balconies, I mean. Yeah. And the first bit of in-game footage from the sequel to 2007's Kane and Lynch hit the internet this week, debuting a new fly-on-the-wall documentary style. This time round, it's Lynch that takes centre stage, which is certainly no bad thing, because he was always the more interesting character in the way that only drug-addled schizophrenics can be. The original game was very stylish, but also very flawed, unfortunately, so I'm hoping that Kane and Lynch Dog Days can reach a little bit further. Welcome to Shanghai. And especially as production for the film based on the first game is now in full swing, the director confirming that Bruce Willis is on board as Kane and Jamie Foxx will be playing Lynch. Not the most obvious bit of casting, I'll grant you, but when has Hollywood ever listened to me, eh? And in a year that's seen more mainstream interest in video games than ever before, the video game BAFTAs were more glitzy than ever, according to first-hand reports. I say first-hand reports, I wasn't actually there, despite judging one of them. Yes, yeah, it's, it's fine. And the BAFTA goes to... Anyway, the big winners on the night were Uncharted 2. It picked up four of the special golden faces, with Batman Arkham Asylum picking up a couple as well, including coveted Best Game Award. Uh, both richly deserved, obviously, as was the fellowship induction of Nintendo legend Shigeru Miyamoto. As always, mainstream coverage of the event wasn't all plain sailing, with uh, plant botherer du jour Alan Titchmarsh weighing in on CVG's Tim Ingham with surprising ferocity, joined as he was by equally out-of-touch actress Julie Goodpeas. I am categorically scene. against violence for entertainment. And Kelvin McKenzie, famous for printing shite like this as editor of The Sun. We as a nation have a failing, we fail to understand that video games have set age categories exactly the same as film do. Mr Ingham, to his credit, remained calm and collected in what in the end amounted to some sort of Stalinist show trial. The realm of censorship. Of common decency. Of, of censorship. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you would say common decency, I would well, say censorship. That's cens a bigger fear for me. Weirdly, a quick gaze down Good Peas' IMDB film credits shows that she was actually in Shock Horror, a violent video game. I, d I mean, really. So, a lot's been said in the gaming press this week about the fact that seminal 90s television show Games Master may very well be making a welcome return to our television screens. Thing is, nobody really knows who's going to be presenting it. Thought I'd get my foot in the door early and go and see a man who may be able to help. Hmm? Hello Games Master, I heard that your television show's going to be coming back. Um, have you got anyone to host it yet? <laughs> Games Master? That's the juicy part. The early 20th century was a period. Poor old fella. Anyway, let's have a look at what I've been playing possibly in my pants.
Just Cause 2. I mentioned this one last time out, but uh, it's out this Friday, the 26th, and I've had around about two weeks to play it, and to be honest, I've mainly been doing stuff like this. Or at least trying to, anyway. Uh, set on the fictional island of Panau in Southeast Asia, swarthy hero Rico sets about trying to destabilise the region and overthrow the evil dictator Pandak Pane uh, using speedboats and aeroplanes and, and big old guns as well. But is it any better than Just Cause 1? Well, in a word, Yes, it is. Not just because of the improved graphics and the much more substantial, weighty control system. No, what impresses me most about this one is the scale of it. You go from mountainside to jungle to villages, even underwater, is just breathtaking. The world's so much larger than anyone I've ever seen before, I think. Missions can get a little bit tiring as you're expected to eat up miles and miles of the huge island each time to go and kill someone or get something. But to be quite frank, I've been playing this non-stop for around 20 hours or something and I've only just managed to get around to do a few of the missions because there's so much to distract you. It's all about the chaos. Tying one end of your grappling hook to a statue, the other one to your car, then driving off, smashing it to the ground. Oh, it's simply just a lot of fun. Yes, it's unrealistic, and there are parts of it that are indeed still broken. Uh, for example, there's no sort of cover system, so you always feel a little bit exposed in the middle of a firefight. And also, the checkpoint system is also a little bit erratic. But to be honest, I couldn't give less of a toss, because I just did this. Why should we hesitate? Let's shoot this red spy and be done with it! Next up, it's a game that seemed to come out of pretty much nowhere. Metro 2033. It's a survival horror shooter based on a book. Remember them? Welcome to Exhibition Hunter! The game's all about the struggles faced by a set of underground human colonies in a, a post-apocalyptic Moscow, which is a setting seemingly very attractive to games companies making games in the ex-Soviet states for some reason. Uh, you play a fellow by the name of Artyom, a man who's lived all his life under the abandoned metro stations, uh, safe from the radiation outside. And of course, Artyom's the only man to save humanity and kill all the mutants that live above ground. And if this all sounds a little bit like Fallout 3, well, to be honest, it doesn't really matter, because after all, Fallout was one of the defining moments of this generation of gaming, and it never had Nazis in it, and this game does, so uh, there you go. Graphically, it's frequently superb. The claustrophobia of the, the smoky metro tunnels and the, the bits where you're forced to put a gas mask on, they're often quite exquisite. And while this isn't a game that makes many concessions to the gamer who isn't very good, i.e. me, it's still a compelling, exciting story, which is well worth a play. And there's a character at one point who's called Bourbon, which is fantastic. Hey, so that's your reviews out of the way. I thought it'd be nice if we took a, a trip down memory lane once again with a little bit of retro. This week we're taking a peek at a game from back in 1991 on the Amiga, a game by the name of Moonstone, A Hard Day's Night. <laughs> It was a medieval hack and slash game in the main. They also mixed in a little bit of uh, strategy as well. The object of the game was to return something called the Moonstone to Stonehenge. You'd travel around the map kicking seven bells out of anything that you came across, basically. Monsters like little unicorn piggy things, will-o'-the-wisp things, great big dragony things. To be honest, any hint of a main theme or style was completely drowned out under a torrent of blood. This game was the greatest thing that could have possibly happened to an 11 year old boy. And it was all pretty much made by just two men back in the days when that was still possible. Uh, they even nicked all their sound effects from the film Red Sonja as well. It was impossibly violent, massively frustrating, and dare I say it, it's ripe for a remake. Good times. Right, it's that time again. Let's have some bad video game box art. In at five, Shadow Dancer. A massive hit at the time, but what the hell is wrong with that dog?
Now, Crackdown, a game that appeared on every games machine in the 1980s, seemingly. I've no idea what that man's face is doing. Or what that is. I know what that is, I just, I just don't know what it's doing there. Now, come up with a video game title in three seconds. Three, two, one, what have we got? It'll have to do. From 1984, wow. So am I, sweaty spaceman, so am I. And in at number one this month, Necrovision. A Necrovision, Necro Necrovision. So there you go, a bit of a bumper episode this week. Apologies uh, if you're bored half to death. Uh, you can hit me on this email address if you'd like to get in touch with the show. Thanks for watching. Yeah.